All right, so I'm coming to you from the lovely Preveli Gorge on the island of Crete. It's just a lovely set of scenery around me, and uh, we're going to be discussing landscapes in early Greece. And by early Greece, I mean the earliest humans and hominids to arrive into the area that we think of as modern Greece today. So tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago, hunter-gatherers that were living here. Um, and so we're going to be looking into how landscape, the landscape has changed over time. Then we're going to see how humans interact and adapt with that landscape. And then finally, we're going to check out how archaeologists use our understanding of the landscape, both today and in the past, to be able to explore archaeology. But let's look at the landscape of what we call Greece today. Um, so as we can see, Crete, the large island of Crete, is near the bottom of the screen and to the south. Further north is a set of islands that we call the Cyclades, and we'll be looking specifically at Milos. Um, to the west is the mainland of what we call Greece today. Um, the southern part is the Peloponnese. It's marked by the three fingers that we can see jutting out to the south. And further north, the territory of, of modern Greece stretches out into the Balkan regions. Um, do check out Sidari in the upper left. That's on the island of Corfu. So we're going to be exploring most of the sites that you see here um, on this map and understanding how they fit into the landscape throughout in the Stone Age of Greece. So let's think about our timeline here. Specifically, let's think about it at a geo geological scale first. So there's the Pleistocene, which we often call the Ice Age, which began about two and a half million years ago. And eventually, that transitions into the period that we're now in called the Holocene, where the glaciers have receded and it's warmer. Um, and that began around 11,500 years ago. When we think of the Ice Age, we oftentimes think of glaciers, of course, like the Alps here. Um, however, in Greece, the, well, what we call Greece, the, this, the glaciers did not extend that far south, though there was one, a small one, near Mount Olympus. Um, and when we think about the Ice Age, it's not just some sort of static period. Um, our understanding um, from paleoclimatological studies shows major changes in temperature for brief periods of time. So if you look at the top blue line, the zero is around today's temperature. And for much of the Ice Age, it was about 6 degrees Celsius cooler than it is today. That's about 12 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's on average. But you see these spikes that occur. These are interglacial periods. These are periods where the Earth warmed, the ice melted, and they were periods actually very similar to our own. And they lasted around, on average, 10,000 years. There were several of them that split up the Pleistocene. This is one of the reasons why we actually know that our own period of, of extending warming that's going on right now is caused by humans. If we were still following the natural interglacial cycles, we would actually be expecting to be tra transitioning back to an ice age. Not right away, maybe in 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 years. But what we would not expect is for it to be getting warmer right now. If you look at these sort of interglacial periods, you see there's a sharp spike of warm, of warm period. And then they gradually get cooler until it accelerates back to an ice age. And so this is really key to understand our own context even. Uh, and how we're affecting the climate during what should be an interglacial period, not global warming. So all right, let's map out these kind of geological periods onto cultural periods. So we're going to be looking at the Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age, and the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age. This video will end at the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, when the first farmers arrived into the Aegean region, into the area we now call Greece. Um, now, the Paleolithic is an extremely long period of time from about 2.7 million years ago um, and started in Africa, of course, with the first hominids creating tools. Um, the Middle Paleolithic, oh, the Lower Paleolithic is oftentimes associated, at least this far north, with Homo erectus populations. The Middle Paleolithic is more associated with Neanderthal populations, and the Upper Paleolithic roughly corresponds to when humans, mo modern Homo sapiens sapiens, arrived into this area. So why do we call it the Upper, Middle, and Lower Paleolithic? It's because when we dig, the lower we get, the older things are. So when we look at kind of a stratigraphic profile of what we've been digging, the lower Paleolithic would be underneath the Middle Paleolithic, which would be underneath the Upper Paleolithic. And so that hopefully helps explain these confusing names. So these are definitely a Stone Ages. 
And so most of the artifacts that we find are made from stone, primarily from flint. Um, and so the, the reason why is because flint and also obsidian, which is a volcanic glass that we'll see a little bit of later, they fracture in a, in a specific way. It's called a conchoidal fracturing. And this allows for controlled shaping and creation of sharp edges to create implements in a, in, in a way that humans can control. And that's really important because they're not just bashing rocks together. They're using a hammer stone or an antler to be able to shape a tool or an object that they can use, mostly for cutting of some sort and of various sizes. And of course, we're thinking about periods where most of the archaeology comes from caves. So we'll be checking out a number of caves, um, in particular Frankthi Cave, one of the most important Stone Age sites from the area of modern Greece. But I think we should first stop off at the site of Marathusa, located near the center of the Peloponnese. Um, and this is actually the site where we have the earliest evidence for hominid occupation in the area. And so uh, hominids were there from the lower Paleolithic, and the excavations led by Eleni Panagopoulou have shown that they've been there for around half, they were there around half a million years ago. So we are talking a very, very long time ago. Um, there are no hominid remains that I know of from the site, but they would have probably been Homo erectus. Um, and what they discovered is actually, frankly, amazing. They discovered an elephant slaughter and butchery area. And so there's large um, remains of elephants that were slaughtered and then butchered in situ. And there was a range of stone tools found in the area showing that there was hominids that were targeting these elephants. And this is key because when you think about the Ice Age, we need to understand that the landscape was very different from today. I mean, elephants are not in Greece today outside of zoos. And that's because with most of the water being trapped at the poles, um, the, landscape, the, the, the climate was drier, and so areas that we would think of as forested today are instead more savanna or steppe-like with uh, grassland and scrub throughout. And they have a range of animals that are very different from today, things like elephants. Of course, mammoths were further to the north in the colder areas, but also other animals like lions and other kind of things that we would no longer think of as in Europe uh, existed in this area of the Balkans um, during the Pleistocene. And so this site was actually found fortuitously, in a sense, due to mining for lignite, which is a type of coal. And so it was the mining for lignite in between two different seams that identified the site with the archaeological horizon in between them. And it was in this horizon that the paleontological finds of the elephants and the archaeological finds of the stone tools were found. Uh, it's very fortuitous because most of our finds come from caves um, from this period. Caves kind of act as, kind of, as, a, as a time capsule that will protect the, re, the archaeological remains from things like rainfall that will disturb them. They will stop them from being overburdened with meters and meters and meters of sediment, making it so that if we find a cave, we can potentially find uh, the evidence that humans and hominids lived in it in the past. We're going to look at some of the evidence from within these caves. And so I'm going to take you to the Malcolm H. Wiener Laboratory for Archaeological Science, where we're going to look at some animal bones to understand how these early humans hunted uh, within this landscape. So I'm here at the Wiener Laboratory in Athens and we're going to look at some animal bones to get a sense for how Paleolithic people hunted. Um, animal bones, of course, give a sense of the kind of animals they hunted and the kind of strategies that they use. So we're going to look at a couple assemblages of bones. The first one is from the site of Klethi Cave in northwest Greece. Um, it was excavated by Eric Higgs and Jeff Bailey. And I'm going to look at the animal bone report published by Nelly Foka Kosmatatu. And so what the animal bones from this cave seem to show is that they're dominated by ibex. Ibex is a kind of wild goat. I don't have any wild goat skeletons here in the lab, but I do have a domestic goat to give you a sense of what animal we're looking at. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar, different kind of horn morphology and whatnot. Now this cave is located extremely high. Um, in the mountains in northwest Greece at 430 meters above sea level. And so there's a range of ibex bones in the cave, um, but what we can tell is that certain bones are there more often than others. And so what I mean is the type of anatomical part we're talking about, where it is on the leg. And so in the cave, there's a lot of meaty elements from the vertebra, the ribs, um, their shoulder blades, and then the upper sort of front leg. And then there's the hip 
and the upper back legs. But what's missing are the kind of lower legs, sort of these feet bones and little toe bones and things like that. And so what that's telling us is that these hunter-gatherers probably needed to range around through the mountains to be able to hunt these ibex, and they prioritized bringing back the meaty parts to the cave for consumption, and they would leave the less meaty parts, the things that were less valuable, at the kill site where they actually hunted the ibex. And so this is interesting because it's so high up, this site has been interpreted by Foka Kosmatatu as a specialist hunting site. And they probably went up there in the summer when it was warm up into the mountains and they focused on hunting the ibex populations that were ranging around the mountains. And then they were only able to bring back to the cave for consumption the more meaty body parts. Okay, so the next cave we're gonna focus on is Klesura Cave. And that's in a very different location from Klethi Cave. It's located in southern Greece in the Argolid. And it's nowhere near as high in the mountains. It's actually just above the Argolid Plain. And so what we're thinking about here is a different assemblage of animals. Most of the animals that end up in this cave are fallow deer. So they're a type of deer species that prefers woodland. So this is a woodland environment. And the hunter-gatherers in the Middle Paleolithic and the Upper Paleolithic, from 60,000 years ago down to about 10,000 years ago, were focusing on fallow deer. However, they had a very different strategy than the hunter-gatherers at Klethi Cave. And what we see is a different body part assemblage showing up. So in addition to the meatier parts of the body, we see a lot of lower legs and foot bones and less meaty parts. And this suggests that the fallow deer were roaming right near the cave. It was not such an effort to schlep the different parts of the carcass back to the cave. And at the same time, we therefore have a different kind of processing going on. The people that lived and, and, and uh, used Klethi Cave uh, were, were interested in extracting as many nutrients as they could, and they would carefully break the bones, even small little ones like toe bones, in order to extract the marrow, because the marrow was an important part of their nutrients. And so there is a slight change in hunting practice between the earlier Middle Paleolithic and then the later Upper Paleolithic. And so what we see, for example, is a change in ages. So during the Middle Paleolithic, they were focused on prime age animals, sort of animals that would have had teeth like this and would have looked like this. And then in the Upper Paleolithic, it included both adults, but also little baby deer. And so this suggests that they were expanding their hunting. And in fact, the cave is used more intensively. There's arguments from one of the excavators, uh, Takis Karkanis, the director here of the lab, that uh, there was maybe even a structure at the site, and there's a newer range of implements that suggests it's being um, inhabited year-long, as opposed to in the earlier period when it was only inhabited during the, cold, the cooler months. And so it's by using these suites of animal bones from body parts to ages, that, and the way they're treated, that we can get a sense of hunting strategies in the Stone Age. So, now we're going to focus on the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene as the Ice Age ends and how this impacts humans. So we have to imagine all this Arctic ice melting and it's going to have a huge impact on the landscape around humans. It's going to cause an increase in uh, sea levels, just as we're experiencing today as our climate warms. It's also going to cause a change in weather patterns, which we're also experiencing today. Notably, in Greece, much more rainfall, which really impacts the landscape. So let's first check out sea level rise by looking at the Cycladic Islands in the middle of the Aegean. And this is a, there's a large number of small and large islands in this region. And uh, in the past, after 130 meters of sea level rise, we can understand that things probably looked much, much different in the past. So here's what uh, it looked like in the past, this sort of paleocycladic plateau. Um, it would have been very, very different. Most of the land is now underwater. Um, and it was much closer to the mainland, so far easier to reach. And so we've lost much of our evidence, of course, for early hunter-gatherers in the late Paleolithic and Mesolithic because those sites are now uh, underwater. Um, what we think of as, as islands today at sea level would have actually in the past been mountain peaks and even uh, large upland plateaus. Um, but we can check out how this affected humans in more detail if we zoom over to Frank the Cave to the west. Frank the Cave is one of the most famous Stone Age sites in Greece. It was excavated about 40 to 50 years ago by Thomas Jacobson. and was one of the first scientific projects in Greece and really revolutionized our understanding of the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, and the Neolithic because all these phases are found in this cave. 
Today, it's actually located right next to the coast. It's a very pleasant walk along the coast, um, and, and it has a great view of the sea um, and the, the Argolid Bay. Um, but in the past, uh, before sea levels rose, the coast would have been much further away. About 18,000 years ago, the coast would have been nine kilometers away, dropping to about six kilometers away 12,000 years ago, and three kilometers away around 8,000 years ago during the Mesolithic. And so we can imagine that this would have impacted humans in a big way, especially as the landscape changes from a sort of more savanna or steppe-like environment to, uh, to, to a more wooded environment, and then finally to sea. Um, so if we check out uh, the, the material culture, the lithics, meaning stone tools, and the fauna, meaning animal bones, from Paleolithic Frankie, we can see that they're crafting flint, mostly a, a local resource, into the tools that they're using to hunt and to butcher. Um, now the animals that they're mostly hunting in the early part of the Upper Paleolithic are large uh, aurochs, which are wild cattle, and a form of wild donkey or ass. And so these would have been well adapted to the kind of steppe-like uh, savanna that the, that the coastal plain, the large coastal plain, would have been at that time. However, as the coastal plain shrinks and rainfall increases, we see a change in the animals that are, that are hunted to mostly red deer. And these are adapted to a forest-like environment. So we can see that human strategies are changing with the local animals. During the Mesolithic, we see a sharp transition um, one of them is in stone tools. The stone tools get much smaller and become what we call microliths. And there's also a few examples of obsidian. If you can see the black stone sort of under the number 16 at the bottom, this is obsidian all the way from the island of Milos in the Cyclades. And this shows that these peoples would have been excellent at seafaring. They would have had to travel um, about 200 kilometers to get to the volcanic island of Milos to be able to extract this resource and bring it back. It, it, was, it was superior to the local flints in many ways for working into stone tools. But if we look more closely at the fauna, what we can see in the Mesolithic is this kind of explosion and sort of species variation. This is what many scholars call a more broad spectrum diet. And so in addition to hunting mammals and large herbivores such as deers that are found near the cave, they also started focusing on sea resources. In the early part of the Mesolithic period, they primarily focused on shallow water resources such as shells, uh, like, like uh, mollusks and, uh, and things like that, and also terrestrial snails, turtles, and other kinds of animals. Um, by the middle part of the Mesolithic, we see an increase into open sea fishes, so uh, barracuda and some tuna. And then finally, by the very end of the Mesolithic, we see this kind of increase in, in tuna bones. There's this focus on tuna at the time. Those are what I have circled there. And it, it seems clear that the local hunter-gatherers probably started to understand the migratory patterns of large schools of tuna that were coming by not too far from the cave. And so during certain seasons, they were able to have a glut of uh, tuna fish, in a sense. And so we can see humans adapting to this new landscape at this time and becoming more accustomed to the sea as the sea gets closer and as their technology changes and the landscape changes around them. And this is a characteristic of, much of Mesolithic culture that we found so far. Much of it is near the coast. Not all of it. There is some Mesolithic from Theopetra Cave. But uh, along western Greece, there is a series of shell middens. In particular, a very famous one is from Sidari on the island of Corfu. And I could not get a picture of one of these from Greece. But this is an example of a Mesolithic shell midden eroding out of a scarp in the United Kingdom. And so we have to imagine giant, giant piles of shellfish that were collected and consumed by these Mesolithic hunter-gatherers as they were exploiting kind of these new environments um, that the rises in sea level uh, made available. Now, the Mesolithic culture in Greece has been very difficult to find over the last several decades. And so Curtis Runnels and his team, what they did is they put together a site location model to be able to identify more Mesolithic sites, to be able to understand better how Mesolithic culture operated in Greece. And so what they did is they, they, their model is based on the assumption that Mesolithic foragers were responding to the environmental possibilities created in the early Holocene by the loss of coastal plains to marine transgression, meaning sea level rise, and the replacement on land of the late Pleistocene Artemisia steppe with a more open woodland. 
Their model predicted that Mesolithic foragers established residential sites and special purpose sites, such as hunting stands, overnight camps, shell middens, and flint extraction sites in one, locations with the widest range of plant, animal, and other resources, so primarily coastal wetlands, like near Frankthi Cave or Sidari. Two, they had caves and rock shelters near fresh water. And three, the early Holocene coastline is near the present shoreline, because this minimizes the effects of the rising sea that would have on submerged sites on the coastal plain. We need this if we're going to be able to find them, because obviously so many Mesolithic sites are now underwater. And so what they did was they chose an area near Frankthi, and they did a survey around here in the Candia region in the Argolid, and they found dozens of Mesolithic sites, oftentimes near caves, a few were in caves, and some, as you can see, are right on the coast. And this has just exploded prehistoric Paleolithic and Mesolithic research in Greece as different teams are starting to put together site location models to be able to find these ephemeral Stone Age sites that were produced by hunter-gatherers, some of which might still exist on the ground and others that could exist in caves. So what I'd like to go now is see how this has been applied to the island of Crete to the south, looking at the Plakias Regional Survey directed by Thomas Strasser. And so what he's found is evidence of Stone Age seafaring because Crete is, let's go back a second, is nowhere near the mainland. It, to get there from the mainland takes an extensive sea voyage. And so he used many of the same principles put together by Runnels, and in fact, Runnels was part of the team. Um, and what they did was they surveyed the landscape and looked for stone tools. And they were able to find a large number of stone tools throughout the landscape. Um, the larger ones here are argued to be from the Lower Paleolithic. Um, however, we don't have any absolute dates yet. They come from a road cut that I'll show you in a second. The lower ones, on the other hand, are tiny little Mesolithic microliths. All this white stone, by the way, is quartzite. It's, less, it's much more difficult to be, able to, to be able to flake and control and transform into a tool than obsidian or flint. There is no local flint in the area of Plakias. However, you notice in the lower right corner there's some obsidian there. And so the, the, the smaller uh, quartzite and obsidian come from excavations he did. Uh, that Strasser, Thomas Strasser did, and uh, they, they showed that there was a connection between Crete and Milos in the Mesolithic period as well. So here's the Mesolithic site of the Amnoni that he excavated. You can see in the, at the bottom in the foreground some of the small trenches that were put in, and this is where those small stone tools came from. And in the back is a sea cave that was molded by the waves when the, when the sea was much higher uh, in, the, in the distant, distant past. And so this is a very clear example of a nice Mesolithic site, the very first one found on Crete. Um, and those larger, uh, uh, potentially upper Paleolithic tools come from this road cut near Preveli Gorge. And so it, uh, you can see it's similar to finding the site of Marathusa, modern uh, interaction with the landscape, um, making a cut in order to make a, lay a road surface, is what created a, a profile that archaeologists were able to find likely stone tools that date back, we don't really know the exact age, but certainly tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, and Preveli Gorge is just such a beautiful landscape. It's really what you sort of picture as a land before time. Um, it's very, very lush um, with a river running through the gorge. We're looking down from the site um, on the gorge. And it comes out on a beach that's just lovely. Well, there you have it, the landscape of early Greece. Before I go take a quick dip here at the lovely Preveli Gorge, I'd like to make a few quick corrections. First of all, the start date of the Upper Paleolithic here in Greece is now thought to begin about 40,000 years ago, not 35,000 years ago. And that's just because as, as we find new things, these dates are always subject to revision. Second of all, the stone tools found in the Plakias region, so not far from here, uh, were made mostly of quartz, not quartzite. And that's just my bad. Third of all, I forgot to mention that the director of excavations at Klisura Cave was Margarita Kumuzelis, and the author of the Animal Bone Report was Brett Starkovich. And finally, I'd like to give a big thank you to the American School of Classical Studies at Athens and the Malcolm H. Wiener Laboratory for Archaeological Science for letting me film using the reference collection. And a personal thank you to the director of the lab, Takis Karkanas, my former boss. He's actually one of the leading figures researching Paleolithic Greece, and he's, he's worked with most of the projects that we talked about today. 
Well, all right, I hope you all get a sense of how the landscape has, has changed drastically over the years, over thousands of years, in the Ice Age and all the way down till today, and how hominids and humans were able to adapt to these changes in the landscape. And importantly, how us archaeologists use our knowledge of the landscape to be able to find new archaeology. It's for this reason that this video is probably out of date by the time that you're seeing it. But I'm going to ignore that for now, and I'm going to go take a dip here at Preveli. So I'll see you all later. Bye.